Dollarhide. Um, thank you. Um, Ryan has, has started the recording. Um, I'm Colette Dollarhide. I'm the program chair, professor and program chair for Counselor Ed. Um, I'm also serving as co-chair for the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee for Educational Studies. Um, <clears throat> um, Kristen Mills is my co-chair. She is tied up right now in some uh, dissertation uh, meetings, and she said she would join us as soon as she could. So hopefully she will pop in as soon as she's done uh, with those important meetings. Um, but what that does is it gives me the delightful opportunity to be able to introduce our guest speaker today and to welcome all of you here. Um, so the um, this is a, um, a really, really great um, discussion presentation uh, about uh, that, that Dr. San Pedro has um, has proposed, has brought to us. Um, and in, in by way of introduction, um, I'm going to share a couple of things about Dr. San Pedro. Uh, Dr. San Pedro is an associate professor of critical studies in education, race, justice, and equity, and an affiliate, <clears throat> excuse me, affiliate faculty member of American Indian Studies and co-founder and faculty advisor of the Indigenous Community of Graduate and Professional Students at Ohio State University. He is Filipino American and grew up on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Western Montana. His scholarship focuses on the intricate link between motivation, engagement, and identity construction, <clears throat> excuse me, to curricula and pedagogical practices that recenter content and conversations upon indigenous histories, knowledges, and literacies. His latest work focuses on the intergenerational lessons learned in the homes of five Native American families, specifically the way they teach one another indigenous knowledges and sovereignty rights as they relate to everyday resurgence efforts. He is an inaugural Gates Millennium Scholar, a Cultivating New Voices Among Scholars of Color Fellow, a Ford Fellow, a Council of Anthropology and Education Presidential Fellow, and a Spencer Fellow. So um, with no further ado, Dr. San Pedro, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much um, for that warm welcome. And it's so nice to just see uh, familiar faces uh, and folks I have yet to meet. Thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. I want to specifically thank uh, Colette Dollarhide and Kristen Mills for the invitation into the series and for their ongoing support for this re uh, for this presentation. Uh, I also want to recognize the collective brilliance of the Department of Educational Studies, the faculty, students, and staff there. You all are doing amazing things. And we as sort of a, a siloed institution, we just don't have that many opportunities to share our appreciation for one another. Um, and so I just wanted to recognize you all, the, the brilliance that you are, um, and thank you for welcoming me into your space. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and get going on this presentation today. Uh, yeah, there we go. So I titled today's presentation, Co-Constructing Spaces of Belonging, to think about the ways we can envision and support expansive spaces of belonging, particularly for Indigenous students at OSU. On that note, I'd like to recognize the American Indian Studies faculty who helped to generate uh, a couple of reports on the state of Indigenous presence at OSU, specifically the contributions and efforts of Drs. Alyssa Washuta, Matthew Anderson, Marty Chatsmith, John Lowe, Cheryl Cass, Madison, Cash, uh, Madison Eagle, Teresa Lynch, Daniel Rivers, as well as the amazing family duo of Shannon and Indigo Gonzalez. Indigo is with us. I'm guessing um, her mother might be uh, a, a little bit further along. Um, and many other Indigenous faculty, students, and staff, and allies in the cause who continue to push OSU to uphold its land grant agreements as we consider what it means to belong at a predominantly white land grant institution. And so in my presentation today, uh, I hope to show through a series of three stories what belonging looks like, as well as with the first story, what unsupported belonging looks like. First, I'll share the state of Indigenous presence at OSU, then move to a retrospective look at my life and work in relation to Indigenous families, and then finally offer envisioning pathways forward with you all. 
So to do so, I offer a, a quote that sets the foundation for the importance of story, something really important to my scholarship. And it comes from Coetian scholar and friend, Emma Elliott, out of the University of Washington. Emma and I have three co-authored chapter contributions in press, and we'll be working over the summer and the next fall to draft a book. I'm going to put it out into the, into the universe to draft a book centering Indigenous storying as methodologies. And so Emma shares with us that stories can connect on multiple dimensions of emotion, thereby transforming possible outcomes. And so for us, stories are powerful, stories are intentional, and I hope that I can honor the stories shared with me to impart some of that power to those that are here today. And so with that, I will start with a story. So this past month, Madison Eagle, the coordinator for belonging and students support, uh, which is a role on campus, uh, part of the Office of Student Life, hosted a fry bread dinner in the Ohio Union Instructional Kitchen. I biked to this event with my 19 month old son Kindred and we walked into the Ohio Union. And on our way to the event, we quickly snapped a shot, um, a photo with Brutus, and we wandered to the basement where they have the state of the art kitchen classroom. I don't know if you all have, have been down there, but it is beautiful. And on Thursday nights, a couple of times a month, uh, you and your partner can go there and cook just offering some, some props to there. We, on our way down, we took another photo with Butter Brutus, the first time I've ever seen Butter Brutus, um, and saw the most amazing display of ingredients all laid out for the participants to make their own fry bread. There is a spirited debate historically between Matthew Anderson and Madison Eagle on whether or not you should poke a hole in your fry bread. Some indigenous communities do, some don't, and both think it's sacrilege to do it the other way. There were six uh, kitchen stations set up with all ingredients to make fry bread. Kindred and I posted up on one to get this underway since we were both very hungry, and I was eager to see him experience his first fry bread. As a bonus, the ingredients were also laid out for sweet potato pie for dessert. There was heavy cream, white and brown sugar already mixed, condensed milk, egg yolks, and all the finer mixtures were pre-measured and ready to mix. So, so much thought and care went into creating these multiple stations. And if you were lazy or had your hands full like me, fry bread dough in the upper right was already prepared and placed into perfect portions to flatten out and get ready for the hot oil. Uh, Madison helped me fry my bread so Kindred could watch from a safe distance and so it could be cooked correctly. <laughs> um, we made sure to take foodie pictures as well as one with Auntie Madison to capture this moment. As we sat down to eat, we noticed that there were six different table settings with eight chairs per table set for us. There was enough food and places for up to 48 people to eat. In the end, everyone who attended sat at just one table. There were eight of us total. Despite the joy that was created among the eight of us, Madison felt a bit deflated. She said, we just need more indigenous presence on campus. We have the resources, but not the people. I share the story as a way of showing the ways that Ample resources cannot make up for the lack of indigenous presence at OSU. And so I'm thinking about this event, uh, about Madison's feelings and um, her statement during this event, as I'm seeing the increased use of land acknowledgements that now show up on people's outlook signatures or are shared at the beginning of presentations or events that really do the important initial step of recognizing the pain of our histories. It's important that we know that peoples who lived among these lands since time immemorial were forced to move away from these lands that now these institutions, this institution particularly, continues to profit from. These land acknowledgements have gained popularity over about the last 10 years or so. And however, during that time here at OSU, our indigenous student population has been in a steady and troubling decline. 
According to a report generated by the American Indian Studies Program, led by Dr. Alyssa Washuta of the Department of English, uh, since 2010, American Indian student enrollment has decreased by a staggering 77%. Further, faculty members are also, or faculty numbers are also staggeringly low. The university employed 11 American Indian faculty as of 2019, which accounts for 0.15% of total faculty. So for me, as an affiliate faculty member of the American Indian Studies Program and part of the American Indian Council to bring awareness to this issue uh, to university leadership, I remember early in our talks that numbers seem to speak to the decision makers. And so I thought, um, what if we match the percentage of Native Americans in the US, which is generally known to be about 1% of the US population, which in fact, it's doubled that, it's 2%. But let's use this 1% uh, to figure out what that looks like in relation to student and faculty populations at OSU if it were to match the 1% of OSU population. So what would 1% of OSU undergraduate students look like? It would look like having 670 students here. What would 1% of OSU graduate students look like? It'd be 113 graduate students. What would 1% of OSU faculty look like? It'd be 76 faculty members. That's just 1%, right? So let's compare that, right? 1% of undergrad, 670. 1% of graduate, 113. 1% of faculty is 76. The actual numbers, right? Currently, across all campuses and all levels, both undergrad and graduate, we have 43 self-identified American Indian students. And there are 11 faculty with four tenure track positions. We have made um, multiple uh, hires where indigenous faculty are joining us um, this next coming year. In addition, graphs seem to resonate with people um, who like to see stories through numbers. So I share this one that's created by the American Indian Studies Council. This one shows the steady decline of American Indian student enrollment by group. Um, you can see the total number is the top one. Uh, we have professional, graduate, other undergraduate, and I'm not exactly sure what the green one stands for, um, but you can sort of see the steady decline from 2010 to our, to our current situation. And here's another comparing 2010 enrollment to our 2022 enrollment by group. These numbers tell a tale that is similar to the one I began with. With all the resources OSU has, the presence of indigenous people at OSU is on the steady decline. So based on the steady decline, uh, the American Indian Studies faculty co-generated a report offering the following statement. <clears throat> As a land-grant institution with a mission to serve the public, our university has a responsibility to address the needs of our state and region, including issues of national significance, Strengthening the presence and vitality of American Indian students at the university, both in our program and embedded within other disciplinary contexts, can fulfill an important piece of the land-grant mission. We provide ever-expanding insight into the ongoing colonial impact on tribes and tribal members, the evolving forms of government-to-government -government relationships, and the expansive possibilities for applying indigenous knowledges in their land-based contexts. Our ability to continue the work of producing, applying, and studying Indigenous knowledge is under threat. During this critical growth period for American Indian and Indigenous studies at OSU, our faculty remain small, and we seek the institutional support that will allow us to continue to produce excellent research and creative expression while doing everything we can to ensure the successful hiring of faculty in Indigenous studies through the ASC cluster hire and other searches. So the numbers illustrate the importance of people moving beyond the performative, the performativity of a land acknowledgement and into, into the allied actions of supporting indigenous people's presence and belonging. 
as a land grant institution, we have an obligation and we are failing that obligation when it comes to American Indian students, faculty and staff at OSU. The lack of indigenous presence at OSU hurts all of us. They offer wisdom, knowledge, language, and understanding of systems that are land and place-based. We are hurting as a collective when their contributions and epistemologies are not lifted up and not supported. And so I'm passionate about this issue because I've been personally impacted by the beauty of being a part of a Native community and in my upbringing and really all throughout my life. So here's a picture of the lands, the mountains, the waters that I grew up um, along. Uh, this is a picture of, of Polsa, Montana, which uh, lies on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Uh, my family moved there when I was four years old. Um, and I was invited into the homes and lives of the Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay peoples. Um, at the time, being four years old, going to school, um, you don't really have a sense of what ethnicity is. Um, and so what we knew as kids growing up is that we, um, we looked similar. We got really tan in the summertime. Um, and we loved to play basketball and other sports together. Um, and over time, I realized that my history was different from the peoples that I grew up with, that they had a long histories to that place. Um, that oftentimes land was removed um, from them uh, and profited by other people. Um, but I was also brought into um, practices, customs, traditions, celebrations um, that honored the knowledges and stories of the people that lived there. Um, and so I was brought up that way. I saw the ways that they supported their lands and supported their people. Um, and have always been blessed in having those relationships in my life that continue to this day. So before coming to OSU, um, and in addition to living on or near the Flathead Indian Reservation, uh, I taught Alaska Native students in Anchorage. I then did my graduate work at Arizona State University, a university that is world renowned for its support of Native students and faculty. Um, and until I came to OSU, I was living with um, and among a large number of Native peoples, that, that was the norm for me. And so when I arrived here, I was welcomed and invited into the small community of Indigenous faculty, students, and staff. Uh, I co-constructed with Shannon Gonzalez, the Indigenous Community of Graduate and Professional Student Group that actually has been um, on pause uh, because of the lack of Indigenous presence at OSU. And despite my efforts to feel that sense of belonging in these other places, I was um, early in my career at OSU, I was feeling a sense of, of homesickness for the people and places of my youth. And so I did something about it. I went on a journey to visit my Indigenous family and friends. I visited them in their homes and asked if there were a project that we could devote our time to, what would it be and what would it look like? And what we ended up engaging in was a project rooted in indigenous methodologies where story central in their lives were shared with me. We learned about the ways they were teaching intergenerational and dialogic lessons in their homes and communities to their children. They taught me through this project the importance of the everydayness of power of movement spaces, the way small moments add up to larger movements. And so as you listen to a couple of powerful indigenous people in my life, consider, well, let's just look at this real quick. I, I wanna share some of these pictures with you. Um, on the upper left, the very upper left is a very cute kid. That, that is me with my two older sisters. Um, I was raised by them and my mother for the first, um, well, from four to eight years old. Um, my friends playing basketball, playing res ball, uh, in the upper right is a group of students that I worked with while I was at in Arizona, uh, taking a Native American literature course, and they taught me the power um, of what was in my uh, introduction. When we shift curriculum and pedagogy that center tribal ways of, of knowing, um, students who are often um, marginalized or excluded from classroom spaces are recentered. Their motivation, their engagement changes. Um, and they showed me that in the three years that I was there. 
in the lower left in the circle picture, that's the, the community of people that I worked with, the um, indigenous mothers and their families, um, where we spent time together listening to their stories. Um, and we had an opportunity, all of us, to come together um, in Polson, Montana, on the reservation, to share stories with one another, to be with one another. And from that, we have all gained lifelong friendships through that. Um, and then the pictures uh, to the right of that are um, people from those experiences, Faith Price, Rue Dowd, um, and their families. Um, and in the lower right is my partner, Sarah, uh, my son Kindred, when he was a bit younger. Um, so I just wanted to kind of talk through that. So the question, um, what are we missing when Indigenous students are not in our classrooms, are not in our university? And what lessons about belonging are being offered to us in these stories? And so I'll come back to these questions. So think about these. Um, I think we'll have about 10 minutes uh, if you'd like to just unmute and share any answers to these questions um, as we listen to the power uh, of the stories, hopeful power of these stories as we move through them. So this is uh, Sila and Rue. Um, and in the stories that are offered here, Sila uh, shared about her internal feelings when being nudged by her mother Rue to speak in front of the city council to change Columbus Day to an Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and we also get to hear from Rue uh, the, the important nudges um, that are offered uh, for her daughter or for their daughter. Um, that was really scary for me, actually. Yeah. Um, we had, she was like, hey, you're speaking. She was like, hey, do you want to come? And then she's like, by the way, you're speaking tonight. She likes to do that to me. Yeah. She's like, tell me, and I'm like, oh, yeah, you're speaking. Oh, great. Cool. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> well, talk about that, like her pushing you to, to speak. Um. At times, I'm like, I, well, why? <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this. Yeah. But it's really nice because I guess it's proven to me that I can speak in front of people and like I don't need to like meticulously go over every single word that I'm saying because it will just flow, mm -hmm. especially when I believe in something a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, I've also learned that I cry even when I am prepared. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's just <laughs> something that I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and with that was the first time I was like in front of a big group of people and I was terrified. I was like, oh no, yeah. I'm gonna say something wrong. I'm gonna talk too long. This is just gonna be a complete disaster. Surprisingly, unsurprisingly, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. it turned out pretty well. Um, I made people in the audience cry, which was um, very surprising, I guess. And mm -hmm. I didn't realize like how much I could have, I could affect people until that moment. She doesn't necessarily, but I do think she, I, that nudge, I knew that if I didn't break through her not feeling like she had a right to say anything or her feeling like too scared to do it or like, you know, really pushing her that she would never discover her voice and never discover her power mm -hmm. in the same way, like being able to do that kind of work. Yeah. Well, I think she's discovered that she's powerful mm -hmm. and that her voice is needed in the world mm -hmm. and that she brings a unique intersectionality, right? Like she's super um, s s unique and in her, in her story is very, demonstrative of how the world works mm -hmm. in sometimes not so good of ways but how somehow that still that only just made her stronger and more unique and more powerful and mm -hmm. i think she feels that i i think she feels really like i'm meant to be an advocate and this is one way i can use use my power and mm -hmm. her power really is you know her ability to challenge systems her ability to see the system you know all of that mm -hmm. And I think it, I think she sees them as opportunities to just get better now. Yeah. 
So in this next story, Between Faith and Dahlia, um, Dahlia is sharing um, a couple of stories. One is um, the importance of having an Indigenous faculty member um, in classroom spaces, how much that impacted her. Um, and just, again, the importance of Indigenous presence, not just for students, but for having faculty and staff um, at universities. Then she also talks about um, the transformative action steps that she was taking in order to create productive change at her universities to better center her stories and her knowledges. Hey, Dolly, do you remember mm -hmm. um, taking that American Indian Studies class and like reaching out to your mom about all these different things? Do you remember the, those conversations? Yeah, I remember because I would get done like around 6.30 at night and then I just call her like on my way home or something. Yeah. Or like when I got home and I just like ran to her and be like, oh my gosh, this happened. Did you know this? Mm -hmm. And then I said this. <laughs> I just remember her telling me like this was, I realized at some point this was the first time she'd had an American Indian teacher in her entire life. Yeah. Like never throughout elementary, middle school, high school, none of that. But I remember, um, her saying to me that she felt like she could contribute to this class and her voice really mattered because she knew about these things and they were relative to her life and I just thought that is so important it's so key and I mean to go through your whole educational career without having having that feeling it's just it's wrong yeah. but go ahead I can see Wait, mom, did they tell you that I was chosen for like representative of my whole department of the no, for what um for they're bringing um three college like from columbia dartmouth and bard university they're bringing outside evaluators for hume 110 and so each department got to choose a representative so i went and this was on wednesday <laughs> and no one was critiquing the content at all and i would just like average it and it was nice in like a civilized way i ranted oh i'm so proud of you yay I'm I'm glad so someone glad. said something nobody said anything no okay so all they did was talk about um how oh are the lectures effective do you like the style of the lectures blah 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 do you like how you have little conferences blah 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 so they're only talking about like the pedagogy instead of like the actual content of the class and so like it was getting like towards the last 15 minutes of this hour long kind of thing and so i finally participated i was like i just wanted to like talk about how the content of this course um privileges like western knowledge systems and how it affects mm. people who aren't from this background and if reed really wants to focus on diversity and inclusivity they wouldn't make this the single required course. And because it like makes people with different backgrounds uncomfortable in participating. And they're mainly arguing that a conference style course was like necessary to kind of get into like the read mindset. And I'm like, it doesn't make me want to participate if if first of all we're taking the problems in the material and I was like, I'm not saying that there's not value in like Aristotle, but we can't just let people go through four years of read without critiquing a single thing mm. and so and stuff like that and then i was like and like since i'm like a brown woman and there's all these things that are racist and sexist and it's not my my job to bring up these critiques and stuff like that and i was like why can't we have like different courses offered um for different groups and blah 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 and so then I was done and then everyone was uncomfortable and I was just sitting there kind of angry. And then, um, mm. and then they kind of like, um, moved on. And, and then this one, like white girl who's sitting next to me, like five minutes after I got done was like, well, I just really agree with you and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, sweet. But then afterwards, after she agreed with me, then everyone was like, oh yeah, it was a good point. So it took like a white girl to agree with me for people to care, but <laughs> yeah. I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. That's Thank you. awesome. 
I was really fired up. I was going to talk to you about it, but I was you know, yeah. <laughs> So it was really special for me to be a part of that moment, to, to see uh, Dahlia share for the first time uh, this story with her mother. Um, and I sort of faded, tried my best to fade into the background so they could, they could have their moment. But um, I wanna come back to these the, a couple of these questions. What are we missing when indigenous students are not in our classroom? What lessons about belonging are being offered to us in these stories? And so for just about 10 minutes or so, I'm, well, we'll see how the energy goes. But um, let's just have uh, an opportunity to unmute. If you have any um, ideas or, or thoughts that are simmering in your mind in relation to these questions and the stories that were shared, um, feel free to unmute and share. jump in hi thank you for doing this um it's really powerful um i would i would say one reflection for me is that belongingness doesn't necessarily feel comfortable um for these students who are having the opportunity to engage in these spaces in ways that they never have before mm -hmm. and so i think we need to be mindful as we're creating these spaces for that purpose to realize that um, it brings up for things and maybe triggers them in ways that we need to be sensitive to and attend to beyond just creation of the space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking, I was thinking about, um, I saw a post somewhere that said, if your existence is only supported through, um, through higher ed institutions, you will not sustain yourself. You need spaces beyond the university in order to engage in community, engage in friendships um, that sustain you, that nurture you. But I do think that at, at university, we do have a responsibility um, to create those spaces of support, to create those spaces of belonging. And for me, a lot in, in the pedagogical work that I do, more and more tensions, disruptions, ruptures um, are coming up a lot, but not only those, the importance of healing um, and how we how we um, support one another as we're all on these roads to being and becoming in ways that we can we can take that next step collectively. So thank you so much. Can I just jump in quickly, Tim? I'm sorry, and say just that reflection that you just made about the fact that maybe teaching others in the space about how to engage in a way that is constructive and and um, healing because that may not come naturally to them either. Absolutely. Thank you, Melissa. I was really struck with the, uh, the first um, story, the first um, Sila and Rue, and, and the impact of having someone who looks like her, someone who shares that cultural identity uh, with her in that learning space, um, and the, the fact that, you know, that was the first time ever in her life. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, that, that was a very, very powerful statement, just the mm -hmm. reminder of how important that is. Yes, thank you. Any other thoughts come up in relation to these questions? Dr. San Pedro, one of the, I think, challenges I have as a white cis male is not placing, not having an expectation of placing responsibility on my students to educate me or to educate our class. And I, and I, I want to be respectful and, and allow for expansiveness for any of our students, any of my students to contribute. Um, but I, I sometimes I, I feel like it's so unfair for me to have that expectation because I don't understand your culture. You need to educate me where some people are not comfortable doing it. That's not what they want to do. Right. Yeah, I think there's a fine balance there, David. Thank you for, for saying that. Um, I think sometimes we have these assignments in our classes that feel disingenuous, like uh, who we are stories are a popular one now, like doing it as one assignment, doing it in the first session, and then being done with it and not having the energy and support behind it or asking students to teach us, as you were saying, 
to tease us about them. But I do think that there's power of creating um, in our classrooms spaces, assignments to support them in their learning, to support them in their navigation of identity construction, um, and to also show our sense of construction of identity of belonging concurrently with our students, right? So in all the assignments that I ask in my classes, uh, I do something similar or I, I model it, um, not as necessarily a, 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 an exemplar uh, of the assignment, but to show that I'm along this path with them, that I'm constructing my identity with them. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it moves beyond asking students to teach us about them and into realms of helping them engage in the self-reflection that's purposeful and productive for them. All right, maybe one more comment and then I'll continue on. I'll briefly add something now that I'm done doing Aaron's hi, I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, as someone who's Indigenous, Afro-Indigenous, and Two-Spirit, um, and I grew up in Hilliard, Ohio, um, and so being one of the few Native students and the Native families in the community, even though there were so few of us, I had a lot of support from my teachers at a young age, so that kind of elementary school age, especially for like the cultural fairs. And so I was the one at the table with all my like, Native artifacts and my toys and everything to talk about being Indigenous. And surprisingly, it actually was really well received as an alternative to what we were learning in like our fifth grade social studies class. And so even though there's a lot of pain and sometimes trauma that can come from doing these things like a cultural ambassador at the age of eight or nine years old, it's actually been more of like an initiation into how to talk about our peoples living in places that aren't where we are represented always you know, very different from those who may be coming from the res or communities where you see native people or people like you all the time um, to then being in a very kind of white suburban and um, different economic status community and kind of seeing where I'm a part of that community, even though it's not a cultural like kind of similarity. So it gave me more of a sense of home and what it means to be in Ohio than it is that so specific because of being in the diaspora. So I think for a lot of people who are mixed, especially those who are mixed black and indigenous, we have a different experience when it comes to these teachings of who we are in our culture, especially in our elementary school teaching, and then translating that to college where sometimes we have to even be more separated. When I was in college, I felt like I had to pick one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I think like early education, um, K through 12 can be more transformative than even your more expansive years when you get into the higher um, levels of learning. So. Yeah. That's my little tidbit. Thank you, Indigo. And just the importance of intersectional belonging. Um, you know, people who are of mixed heritage, the what we're asking them when we um when we create these spaces that are so specific to one identity rather than another, but having spaces of belong that allow people to belong in their wholeness. And if you haven't checked out Indigo, she Indigo is an amazing artist. So if you want to drop a link in there and, and get your work out there, please do so. No shame. Um, all right, thank you all for uh, for sharing your connections to those uh, to those questions and those stories. So let me just jump right back into it. Um, let's see. So for me, just to address these questions themselves, um, I feel like we miss out on the richness of stories, of knowledges, of the ways um, these students and others have resisted systems. Um, we miss out on stories of how the how they are supported at home, um, the ways that they engage in uh, la land, language, and cultural rejuvenation. Um, I was just listening to, and maybe some of you also attended, um, the Indigenous scholar Dr. Robin Kimmerer, who wrote Braiding Sweet Sweetgrass, and she said that 77% of the biodiversity in the world exists on Indigenous held territories. 77%, which makes me think that we are missing out on the original and ongoing land and water protectors who can push us in our thinking and allow us to have clear paths and intentions in moving forward in our work in our world. And so I want to begin to close by asking us, um, sorry, what did the numbers tell us uh, about who belongs at OSU and who does not? And how can we live up to the wrongs done by the history of land grab universities? 
And so I think a good place to start is to listen to the indigenous community um, that uh, the American Indigenous Studies at OSU um, that, that we've put together. And so I'm gonna drop a couple of files into the chat now. One is titled Recruiting and Retaining American Indian Students, Faculty and Staff, Current Priorities. And another one uh, was generated by the American Indian Council. And that one was titled Supporting the OSU Indigenous Community. Um, and this has just been ongoing work um, to right the wrongs that we are seeing before us. So I want for you in your own spaces to consider the ways that as you look through these documents, con consider the ways that you can support these asks. And I'd also encourage you to give these a look and to share these with people in your program. And so in their reports, I'll just kind of um, synthesize a few main points. Um, they, we suggest that we build toward a critical mass of people um, as evidence in the information that I shared here um, and drawn from the reports. Um, there's just very few indigenous people. Um, there's a need for strategic recruitment and retention. Um, so some, some people are doing this, but it, there needs to be ongoing support. Um, and I think to Indigo's point, um, recruitment without a focus on retention is like, I don't know, it's like serving uh, a beautiful plate of food to somebody who's allergic to the main ingredient, right? It's just not, it's not gonna work. Um, and then establish a plan of cultural competencies uh, that we work to move beyond movement moments to a movement of reconciliation and respect. Additionally, um, they suggest institutionalizing support through the university uh, rather than start initiatives in response to moments, support over time efforts to form a movement and um, being support as allies, calls to support Indigenous students, faculty, staff, by considering the roles each of you hold individually and examine what you can do for Indigenous peoples here on OSU's campus and beyond. And I would also like to offer Ed Studies and to my department in the teaching and learning um, to just look at your own numbers, how many Indigenous students are in our departments. In addition, if we were able to successfully recruit Indigenous students into our programming, what must shift and change in our curriculum, in our programming, in the ways that we teach, in the ways that we show um, that we show them that they belong uh, in our departments and in our institutions. And so finally, in thinking about what belonging looks like at OSU, I'm envisioning the beauty of the Fry Bread event uh, that Madison Eagle hosted. I envision a space where every seat is filled where there are no leftovers, where we can feel a deep sense of connection and pride um, in our OSU native community, and where Madison in all her efforts does not feel saddened that only one table was filled. A place where I can honestly tell students like Sila and Dahlia that you heard from, as well as their mothers, that OSU is a place that nurtures and supports indigenous youth, uh, a place that allows them to thrive and to grow. A place uh, where we can co-construct spaces of belonging. So I just want to thank you all for, for being here. Um, that's just a QR code to my personal um, website that has links to articles um, that reference and to, and to books that I've referenced throughout this presentation. Um, but just want to thank you all for being here, for listening uh, to the state of um, Indigenous presence or lack thereof at OSU uh, and in thinking through what we can do in order to change that. Um, so thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. San Pedro. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, the comments are starting to also pop up uh, in the chat about how uh, grateful people are and um, how much they uh, enjoyed the opportunity to hear this important discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, one person uh, did, a oh yeah, okay. <laughs> one person didn't ask for the QR code again, so. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Are there any final questions for Dr. San Pedro before we adjourn? So I don't have a 
I don't have a question, um, Dr. San Pedro. I just want to um, say, first of all, it's good to see you again. And um, and to just, I say, just thank you for holding space today and sharing what you did. Um, I really just appreciated the story sharing, the story sharing element of, of what you shared. And um, it was just a really beautiful and powerful presentation. And I think just also really vulnerable in sharing your story with us and sharing the stories of um, just indigenous peoples. Um, it's, again, it's a uh, voices we don't hear very often on our campuses. And so um, I just express my immense gratitude for taking the time to share that with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. That means so much to me. <laughs> Yeah, the numbers are. Uh, no, and and uh, echoing everything that Stephen just shared too. But uh, thank you so much for for sharing uh, all this important work and and holding this space. Uh, I felt yeah, like just I felt challenged. I felt affirmed in a lot of ways, and felt like okay, this is a an area I need to uh, push myself to learn more about uh, and be better um, in solidarity with. Uh, so I, I have a question about the data because uh, whenever I see the counts of students and the comparison to 2010, I always think about the change in the collection uh, and the reporting of the two or more races. So uh, we heard Indigo uh, mention, you know, being forced to choose and, you know, um, and then when you asked us to look at our numbers, I was like, oh, let me go look. And I'm like, oh, there's only one, one student in all of EHE. Uh, well, I was just quickly looking, so it may not be, but it might just be Ed Studies. Maybe it's just all of Ed Studies uh, and um, only one graduate student as well in all of Ed, uh, Ed Studies who identifies as American Indian. And I know there are more who are mixed. And mm -hmm. so then when I click the two or more races, there's a lot more students that could potentially be American Indian. And so I don't know, well, yeah, that's good. So if a student is trying to embrace and embody all of who they are, right, um, are they counted? I guess I'm just asking about this decline of 77% from 2010 and just the numbers are starting. Uh, and I don't know what I'm trying to say I'm not trying to like call people out because I know that that's a move to make to gain uh, resources and to just get attention. But I also don't know if that like erases people who did check more than one box uh, when they're for their applications and things like that. So I'm just like trying to like tease that out to see if there if you had any more insights about that and was it a strategy or is it a strategy? Is it really just looking at the numbers? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what they say, or is it is it really like these are the numbers of anybody who identified as American Indian in part or fully or solely? Um, yeah, from my Indian. from my understanding and being a part of those talks, it was um, anybody who identified uh, either just the one box or um, or if they check multiple boxes. So that includes those with multiple and intersectional identities who also included American Indian um, uh, in that in that survey. So um, that's a it's a good point. And maybe, you know, if it were just the sole box um, and the transition to allowing people to include multiple, um, that would explain the numbers. Um, but from my understanding, it includes people um, who checked multiple boxes. Great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Dr. San Pedro, for for people who would like to um, um, learn more and be better allies uh, to our Native colleagues, um, what would you recommend that, uh, you know, what reading would you recommend we start with? Um, I'm familiar with some reading, but um, where where would you like, where would you recommend we start? Uh I think the two documents that I shared with you were compiled by the American Indian Studies and American Indian Council. Um, that's local, specific to OSU, offers recommendations. Um, I think beyond that, um, you know, as you 
include in land acknowledgements um, and in your coursework um, to reference work um, about land grab universities. There's a beautiful website that refers to that. Um, there's a wonderful syllabus that's been created by Amanda Ticini, Brian Brayboy out of Arizona State University and others, I can't remember the others' names, uh, but where they help um, instructors walk through what land grant um, institutions are, um, the connections to how land was taken, how it's being profited from by others. Uh, and as far as um, support, support for places of belonging specific to Indigenous students, there's really good work out there. One, one book that I keep coming back to is uh, Deloria Place and Belonging, or Place, Power and Place. I, can, I don't know if that's the exact, I'm looking at, oh yeah, yeah. Power and Place by Deloria and Wildcat. Wow, I can't believe I spotted that. But this is a really good one just to reference in relation to your pedagogy, the ways that you approach your classroom spaces. And I think, you know, just in the ways that I teach uh, my courses, a lot of my work has been um, deeply impacted and influenced by uh, Indigenous and humanizing pedagogies. And so the uh, work of um, Valerie Shirley, Jeremy Garcia, I resonate deeply with Django Paris's, Django Paris's work, H. Sammy Aleem, Casey Wong, because um, they're really connecting uh, the importance of sustainability with the intersections of identity, including uh, indigeneity. Um, so I, I, I appreciate the ask, and I, sh and I think having a resource ready to go for people with that question is important. So um, let me think about that, and maybe I can compile something. But uh, I think more importantly than that is to think about your spaces of impact, to think about um, your spheres of influence, the, the ways that you might be able to change. Um, I joined uh, a, a new um, faculty senate uh, in order to construct and create state uh, changes naively. I haven't been able to do anything on that, but, um, but I think you know, thinking about the ways in which we can uh, sway people to not only understand the numbers, um, but to offer suggestions on better pathways for it is a is a good way to go. Uh, Dr. San Pedro, this is Karen. Hey, Karen. I just wanted to say to you um, two things. One, I'm really glad you got on the Senate. Be patient. It takes a <laughs> minute and that window and door will open for you to get your foot in and for you to have voice. So hang in there. The second thing is, um, and I'm asking the body this, um, have you, before, I guess I'm asking you, but but also for the body's ears, have you been nominated? Sometimes those of us who teach the way um, you have referenced your teaching, don't, uh, students walk away very excited about it, but they don't get the recognition from faculty because it's a little different. Have you been recognized for a teaching award out of your department? I was nominated. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was nominated. I. So, I <laughs> so who is your who is your um, teaching? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Who is your awards committee chair over there in teaching and learning? Um, I'm not sure. I think yeah. that's something we should know collectively because many voices are better than one. And um, that's something we can move forward, you know, on your behalf. You're doing something unique and important, and it should matter in unique and important ways. Mm. So um, maybe, maybe, Mark, you could inform us about who that might be. Yes, happy to ask into that. Thank you. And I, I'm happy to write up the uh, proposal. Wow. <laughs> I did not expect that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Alyssa. All right. I know we're getting close to time. So uh, I want to echo all the sentiments that were shared. You know, thank you for a very powerful presentation. I didn't, I did get to step out for a second, um, but I, I did was able to hear a, a good chunk of it. Um, but I wasn't sure if this was shared or not. And what sort of resonated with me was about 
retention and recruitment and what does that look like for um, you know uh, indigenous people, indigenous folk, um, and those who hold those identities. Um, there was something that was that really touched with me, um, but it uh, was ge geared towards um, Black identity, and it's called Cluster Walk. If anyone's ever heard of it, um, it's a um, sort of short documentary about a cluster hire of Black faculty. Um, this was uh, based out of SIUE um, and um, um, uh, Southern Illinois University of Edwardsville um, by Dr. Candace Hall. And um, I had the pleasure of being able to view it and it was amazing and how it came from the top down. Like it was everyone involved. It was not only just the college, but also um, uh, lead university leadership. And what does that look like to, to, to have a cluster hire, to build a community? Um, and when you have people who look like you, who are in these sort of positions of power when it comes to faculty, um, it means something to students to, to, to have that re uh, relatability. And so um, I'm happy to share that in the chat um, you know, as possibly a tool that could be, you know, uh, a way to kind of have some kind of alignment and say like, if this is something that worked at another institution, maybe that's something that could, um, we could pick apart and see what, what would be supportive for um, this particular group of, of individuals. So I wanted to just share that and say thank you again so much um, for this presentation. Absolutely. And we do have, uh, to my knowledge, three indigenous faculty hires. I was part of one of the, um, the committees. Um, uh, in the department, there's one in the Department of English, another in Folklore Studies, and the other one, I can't exactly remember where it was, but it was um, based on that um, that cluster notion. And so I think some elements are, are in that. Um, and as we gain sort of momentum with bringing faculty in, uh, I think we need that support, that space, that um, advocacy, uh, to continue to grow so that they see OSU as a as a place that they can um, that they can stay and that they can thrive. Like what I said earlier, it's like being fed a meal where the active ingredient is is um, is something that you're allergic to. So we need to make these spaces nourishing and supportive, not just at OSU, but beyond and really relying on um, like, for example, the earthworks and the rich histories that we do have um, that are existent in Ohio. So Yeah, thank you for sharing that. We we have come to um, uh, on the hour. Um, so thank you again, Dr. San Pedro. This was absolutely wonderful to hear and to contemplate. Thank you for sharing, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's this is the community that we're creating, and um, it's important. These discussions are important. So thank you. Thank you all.